Hello and welcome to the lecture on slab analysis. Now our objectives for today are threefold. So first we have, we're going to discuss the general procedure for slab analysis, which conveniently is very similar to beam, beam analysis and design. Then we're going to identify the ACI code requirements for slabs specifically. Then we'll analyze a slab for a moment, and we'll do two examples. Now, what, how is a slab different from a beam? Well, not very much. Again, you have your slab which spans two, two beams, or say two girders. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at a slab for every 12 inches. So we'll almost look at them as 12 inch wide beams that span between two beams or two girders. Now some nomenclature on the slab, on slab geometry. So again, we'll consider a 12 foot width of slab. And there's two types of steel that are in a slab in the reinforcing. First you have your main steel. And again, this, the main steel is always at the bottom of the slab when we're talking in tension. And again, that is the steel that will take the tension for, for the concrete beam. Now the temperature steel, is al it's also known as called shrinkage in temperature steel. And this is more to keep the slab together to act as one unit. You have your slab of thickness H, which is what we'll designate it as. And typically, if we're talking an interior slab, we're looking at a 3 quarter inch clearance or cover. Now, if you also notice, we refer to this as a one-way slab, or singly reinforced. And the reason why is we're analyzing it as a one-way beam. And in order for it to be considered a one-way beam, let's just make a note of that. So a one-way beam is when you have one of the dimensions is half of the other, or one way to look at it, it's probably easier to point first is that if the, the span that you're designing, so the, the span here has to be half the length of the overall span, or the, the perpendicular, perpendicular side. So here, say if this was 10 feet, that means the perpendicular dimension has to be at least 20 so that you can consider it one way. And the reason why, let's see if we can draw this for you, is we're going to assume that the beam bends essentially in one direction. And the reason why we aren't looking at the perpendicular direction is that it's being reinforced or it's being supported by a beam or a girder in that direction. So what are some other ACI code regulations that we have to look at? Well, first we have to look at the shrinkage and temperature steel regulations. So we have rho min needs to be 0 0.002 if you have 40 or 50 grade steel. And if you have grade 60, it needs to be 0 0.0018. So again, all of our steel needs to be at that, at that minimum. Secondly, what are the spacing requirements? Again, the assumption is that the spacing from center to center of your rebar is not more than the smaller of the two. So again, it has to be at least to 18 inches, or at, I'm sorry, not more than 18 inches, and not more than three times the slab thickness, whichever one is smaller. Now again, starting a new page here, let's look at what the procedure would be for, say, a slab analysis. Again, we said the only difference is that we're looking at a width of 12 inches. But you start the same way. First, you determine M sub U, so the applied factored moment. Sometimes we, I may give it to you in a problem, or it may come from another engineer. Then you look at the ACI codes, particularly for rho. You already know your Bs. You just want to make sure that all of your reinforcements fit. And also, you're going to check You're also going to check your D, effective depth. In order to do that, you also need to calculate your A or the depth of the compression block for the Whitney stress distribution. Once you have your, your parameters that you've checked, if they check out by code, then you can continue. And then you want to determine M sub R, 
which again, remember, is phi m sub n. Just like a beam, we're going to assume that phi is equal to 0 0.9. And the reason is we're assuming that we're having bending in the one direction. And then last but not least, you want to make sure that you're resisting is greater than or equal to your applied. If that's the case, then your analysis is complete. If not, then it's inadequate and either some measure would need to be taken or it'd have to be redesigned in order to be appropriate. So the only thing that we have to look at is the, the rebar spacing. So again, if you notice from before, your rebar is spaced at equal intervals, and typically you start at one half the distance from the edge. So if you're spacing your rebar, say, every six inches, you'd start at three inches from the edge, then you would begin your six inch spacing. Again, just something to keep in mind. You could also use table A4 to help you determine the area per foot of slab. So if you decide to do six number fours, you can do six number fours within that area, I'm oh, sorry, within that width of 12 inches you know that you would have an area for every 12 inches of 0.6 inches squared. So again, for example, here, this is just more of a general. Say, in this particular case, we had two number fives. So we have a, a number five. And in order to fit two of them, we're looking at approximately six inches in between. So we'd have three and three on either side. So we have three inches, six inches from center to center and then another three for 12 inches. So you have a bar spacing of six inches. And your number five, which means you'd have an area of 0.62 inches per 12 inches of slab. There's also another ACI requirement that says the minimum thickness of the slab H has to be at minimum L divided by 20. Now when they say that, they mean the span length in inches, so it's not in feet. So if your span, for example, we said before it was 10 feet, that's 120 inches. You divide that by 16, and that tells you your minimum width. So the best thing to do is to try an example problem, and we'll go through the procedure. So example number one says, a one-way structural interior slab having the cross-section shown spans 10 feet, very similar to my example I was saying before. The steel is grade 60, and the concrete strength is 4 KSI, and the cover is 3 quarters inch, which is for an interior slab. The slab is subject to a service live load of 500 pounds per square foot. Determine whether the slab is adequate for moment. So again, our first step is to calculate what the applied moment would be. But in order to do that, we'd have to calculate our distributed loads. So now for our first step, you know what, I'll try to do step number one here for you. Let me just switch my colors. So for step number one, determine m sub u. In order to do that, we're first going to calculate the distributed load, which is 1.2 times the den plus 1.6 times the live. We get a 1.6 there. There we go. Get 1.6 times our live. Now here it said it's subject to a live load of 500 pounds per square foot, and the dead load we can assume is just the weight of the slab. So in order to do that, let's calculate the dead load. Again, we're considering every 12 inches of slab. So we have 0.15 kips per linear foot. I automatically went into kips just to make it easier for myself. We have a slab thickness of 5 inches. And again, we're assuming per 12 inch slab width. Now, I'm going to convert immediately into kips per linear foot. Again, that should be pounds per cubic foot here. I'm going to get a cube in here for you. There we go. So I'm going to divide by 144 inches squared per foot squared.
if I can get to write that for you. That should give me a dead load. And again, I always appreciate that you do check my numbers. A 0 0.0625. Kips per linear foot. So now that we have our dead load, now let's calculate our live load. And our live load, we just want to look at a per unit width. I'll even highlight it just for a reminder to myself. We're looking at a one foot width. So it's 500 pounds per square foot. I'll multiply that by one foot and then it will bring us back to linear feet. Change its color back to black so you can see it. So our live load is equal to 500. Actually, I'll immediately go into kips. So 0.5 kips per square foot. times one foot, that gives me 0 0.5 kips per linear foot. Now that I have them as distributed loads, I can calculate the factored load, W sub U. So I have 1.2, that should be a 2, times 0 0.0625 kips per linear foot plus 1.6 times 0 0.5 kips per linear foot. That should give you a distributed load of 0 0.875. There we go, kips per linear foot. And since it is a distributed load, the moment for bending is W U L squared on 8. So again, just repeating real quick, I have my 8, 7, 5, times my span is 10 feet squared. Again, always make sure you're using the correct span if two or two dimensions are given. Divide that by 8. That should give me a distributed moment, I'm sorry, a design moment of 10.9 kip feet. Don't know why I keep doing that for on me. So now that I have M sub U, now I'm going to start checking some of my codes. So again, just looking to see where we are. We just took care of M sub U. Now let's check some of our parameters before we calculate the resisting moment. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to check our reinforcement, make sure that we have the appropriate amount. So we have step two. Let's determine row, or we should say check row. Now again, this is slightly different than beams because the row is, is prescribed a little differently. Since we have grade 60 steel, the minimum row that we need to use is 0 .0018. And again, that's in order to make sure the shrinkage and temperature steel is less than whatever we designed. And the reason why is we want to force the failure in the smaller direction or the shorter direction of the span. Shown here, we want to make sure that the bending occurs in the shorter direction, which is our main steel, and not the opposite direction, which is our shrinkage and temperature steel. We don't want the temperature steel to be more, um, we'll say, more stiff than, say, the main steel. So in order to check rho, again, we know our rho min is 0 0.0018. So let's calculate our actual row. Our actual row is equal to the area of the steel. Let's fix that. 
divided by B times D. Now, what is the area of our steel? Let's grab my highlighter for a moment. So from our problem, we said that we have number five spaced every four inches. So as you can see here, the space, the clear spacing between each rebar, not the clear spacing, excuse me, the center to center spacing between rebar is four inches. And then you would have half in between to get your total of 12. So what would that area be? So essentially, you, you're able to get three full rebar of number five for every 12 inches. How does that translate? If you space it every four inches, and you have a number five, that's 0 0.93. So again, we'll just highlight, we'll highlight it just to keep it in mind. So again, our area is 0 0.93 inches squared the base will stay constant that's always 12 inches that we're working with now for our D we're going to need to determine D in order to put it into our formula we you could assume um, D minus about two inches but since this is an analysis and you have the actual area of steel you're better off calculating it because you know it more precisely. So let's just take a moment for a second to calculate D. Again, D is equal to the overall height minus the cover. And again, we don't have any stirrups in this case, so it's just one half the diameter of a rebar. just to make that clear. So our depth is equal to our overall height of 5 inches. Our cover is 3 quarters of an inch for interior minus half the diameter of a number 5 rebar. Again, you can go to table 8.2 if you want to confirm this, but it's 0 0.625. I don't like two there. That should give you a effective depth of 3.94 inches. And I'll have to take that information and go back to our previous page. So multiply our 12 inches by 3.94. And that should give you a row of 0 0.0197. Which in this case is greater than our minimum of 0 0.0018. So we're good. So our row checks that. We have our actual D. Now we'll need to calculate A so that we can determine the nominal moment, which will tell us the resisting moment. This will be what we'll call step two. Do we already have a step two? Yes, I'll make that step three. So step three is our effective depth. And step four is determine A. Again, what is the depth of the compression into the slab from the top? Again, A is equal to the area of the steel times the yield strength of the steel divided by 0 0.85 F prime C times B. So again, our steel has an area of 0 0.93 inches squared. The yield strength of our steel, scary too. The yield strength of our steel is 60 KSI. I'll put kips per square inch. Again, our safety factor of 0 0.85. F times C is 4 KSI. Let's 
Eventually those twos will look good. Times our width of 12 inches. And that should leave us with, again, if we cancel out our units quickly, just to double check. We'll use pink because it's fun. Kips per square inch, kips per square inch. One of the in inches cancel one of the inches, leaving us with just units of inches. Perfect. That should give us an answer of 1.37 inches. So now I know the depth of the compression. So now I can determine the nominal moment. We'll determine n sub n. Again, remember n sub n. N sub u, excuse me, n sub n. One second, I will find out. There we go. So M sub N is equal to the area of the steel times the yield. That's essentially saying F because area times stress is force times our distance of D minus A on 2. We have all of our parameters, so M sub N equal to our area of 0.93 inches squared times 60 KSI our depth is 3.94 minus our A of 1.37 divided by 2 You'll get this answer in kip inches, but you'll want to move it into kip feet. So you should get approximately 181.6 kip inches. So when you divide that by 12, you'll get 15.13, but you're welcome to answer just simply 15 kip feet. Now how does that compare? So going back to our previous page, our applied moment was 10.9, but it can resist 15. So then clearly, the power, clearly this is adequate. So for step six, let's just write that. So for step six, is m sub r greater than or equal to m sub u? Yes, it is. Because 15 kip feet is greater than or equal to 10.9. And it also meets our ACI code. So both both parameters of both requirements are met. I think that deserves a smiley face. So now what I'd like to do is do one more problem. And what I'll have you do, similar to previous lectures, I'll start the problem. So I'll start the step. I'll ask you to pause. I'll write the rest of the solution, then I'll, I'll resume. Try to go through it yourself to see if you get the same numbers, and then I'll continue on to the next step. So our next problem is also a one-way slab, ana slab analysis. So in this case, we have a one-way structural interior slab, just like the previous problem. Although the span this time is 12 feet, the steel is grade 40, the strength is 4,000 PSI, and the cover is still interior 3 quarters of an inch. Now we're being asked to do the problem a little differently. We're being asked to determine the maximum design moment m sub u and the maximum service life load that could be applied to this beam. And we're going to assume that the dead load for this particular example is simply the dead weight of the, of the slab only. Now, again, in this particular case, since we're asked to find m sub u, we're essentially going to do the steps in reverse and then find out what m sub u could be and what w W sub L could be. So let's give ourselves a new page. And bring my pen in. So again, as we're saying, we can't do our normal step one because we don't know M sub U. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try working backwards, and I'm going to start really more in the second half of the problem. So just to show you what I'm going to do. Since I do not know n sub u, I'll do that step last. However, I, wa I was given information about the actual design so I could analyze it, so I can still calculate rho, d, and make sure that I fit within my, my 12 inches. And also, my m sub r, I can calculate, and then I, from there, I can determine what my, minimum, my maximum m sub u could be. So again, first, let me look at my API code. If you want, you can change, use the numbering that is the same as um, your steps, but I'll just start with the step one from here. So again, what I'm going to do is I'm first going to check my, minim my minimum uh, reinforcement ratio rho. So check rho min to make sure that it's less than the rho that's prescribed for the problem. Now what is rho min for this problem? So let's fix that real quick. There we go. So rho min in this case is equal to 0 0.0020. And again, I'll show you that very quickly on our slides. So again, remember, because this is a grade 40 steel, our rho min is 0 0.002. And again, that's to, and again, just to make sure it's clear, I want you to remember that it's because the shrinkage in temperature essentially needs to be weaker than your main steel. Otherwise, your shrinkage in temperature steel won't, won't will be stronger, and then you won't have be you won't bend in the shorter direction. So we know our row min. Let's ca calculate our actual row. And row is equal to A S divided by B times D. So what I will do is I'll calculate D, calculate row, and compare. Try to see if you can do it as well. So did you get a row equal to 0 0.008, which again would be less than the minimum of 0 0.002? One thing just to make sure, did you find that the area of the steel is 0.53 inches squared? So again, going to table A4, you should have got a number 5 spaced every 7 inches for a total area of 0.53 inches squared. So when you calculated your D, you get 5.44 inches. When placed into the row, that's how you got your value, 0 0.008. So now that we've checked out our row, which is good, now what we want to do is calculate our A so we can determine the nominal moment M sub N. Let's just write our direction. So determine. So again, take a moment, see if you can calculate it as well, and see if we arrive at the same answer. Hopefully, you also got a value of 0 0.69 for A. So now continue on and calculate M sub N. So this will be our step number three. And determine M sub N. So again, go ahead, pause, and see if you get the same result that I do. Now, when you determine M sub N, hopefully you also got 9 kip feet or 108 kip inches. So now what we're going to do is work backwards and calculate M sub R, and from M sub R, determine M sub U. So on our new page, calculate M sub R, which is phi M sub N, and I think this is our step number four. Let's determine n sub r. And I'll do this real time because that's quick enough. So we have n sub r is equal to phi m sub n. So 
And again, we assume 0 0.9 for bending. So 0 0.9 times 9 kip feet, which gives us 8.1 kip feet. Now our next step, we're going to assume that our maximum moment that we could apply is, is 8.1 kip feet. Again, because m sub r has to be greater than or equal to m sub u. So if m sub r is 8.1, then our maximum is 8.1 kip feet for m sub u. If that's the case, let's go backward and, and determine what the w sub u would be. But again, we'll just make a note as part of our problem. m sub u max that we can apply is 8.1 kip feet. So we've answered the first part of the problem. Now we need to determine the w u. And then from WU, we'll determine what the live load could be. We know that the applied moment is equal to WU L squared divided by 8. Take a moment and calculate what WU would have to be and see if we get the same. Now, when I calculated WU, I got a maximum applied load of 0.45 kips per linear foot. Now, if that's the case, I'm going to make sure that's per linear foot there. There we go. So now I know that the combined dead load and live load factored cannot exceed 0.45. So what I'm going to do is back solve and determine what WL has to be. So my step number seven is to determine W sub L. Now, to do that, I first need to calculate what the dead load would be. So take a moment to calculate what the dead load would be. Then plug that into WU is equal to 1.2 times the dead load plus 1.6 times the live. And back calculate to solve for what WU must be. Now, when you calculated your applied dead load, you should have gotten a distributed load of 0.81 kips per linear foot. Again, always make sure you convert back to into feet, because right away your, your numbers will be significantly off. Then when you take that information, you have your W sub U, you have your W sub D, solve in terms of W sub L, and you should get a maximum live load of 0.353 kips per linear foot. And this is a typical um, analysis that you would find. You might have an existing slab in a building. The building may be repurposed. It may go from particularly, we saw a lot of this in downtown Brooklyn, particularly in Dumbo, where you had warehouses that were reconfigured for, say, office space, schools. Again, our school was the Voorhees building used to be a munitions factory. We wanted to make sure that the slab would be adequate for, say, educational purposes. So what would happen? is that you would need to go backwards and say, well, this is what we have as a slab. What is the maximum live load that we could apply? Because typically, you cannot change the dead load because that's more of the structural load. So at the end of the day, you want to know well, what is the maximum live load you can apply to an existing slab. So again, you have two example problems. And again, going back to objectives, did we accomplish everything? We did discuss a general procedure for slab analysis, which essentially would be exactly the same as a beam. The only difference is we're looking at a 12-inch width of slab. We also had slightly different ACI code regulations for slabs. And again, that has to particularly do with the thickness, the spacing of the rebar, and the overall effective depth. And last but not least, we analyzed two slabs for moments. So again, thank you. And if you have any questions, please let me know.